This lecture is going to focus on homeostasis, which involves how animals deal with osmoregulation, excretion of nitrogenous waste, and also temperature regulation. Well, what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is the challenge animals face in maintaining a stable physiological state. And maintaining homeostasis requires constant physiological actions. So, for example, animals have to constantly be resupplying oxygen and nutrients to their cells as these elements are processed. After metabolism, they have to constantly move waste products from cells. And then the interior environment has to adjust to changes in the external environment. So, as it gets hot, animals have to do certain things. As it gets cold, animals have to do certain things to remain active. Well, let's first talk about osmoregulation, and to understand osmoregulation and the challenges it poses, you first have to understand what osmosis is. Now, here's the definition of osmosis, and I want you to pay very close attention to exactly what, how this is worded. Uh, this definition is something you need to memorize. Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. All right, so let's break this down. So first of all, what is moving? Water is moving. It's moving across a semi-permeable membrane. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the cell membranes. So water is moving across a cell membrane. And depending on the concentration of solutes, like sugars and salts, water will be moving in one direction or the other. And the best way to kind of understand which way water is going to be predictably moving is think of water liking to go dissolve things. So water dissolves sugars and can dissolve salts. Those are the solutes. Those are the things that water can put in solution. So water is moving from an area where there are not many of those, a low solute concentration, to an area of high solute concentration. So let's say that we had a beaker of water, and in that beaker there were some red blood cells. Now if this water was an isotonic solution, meaning it has the exact same solute concentration in the water as there is inside the cytoplasm of the cell, water is going to be moving back and forth across this cell membrane at about the same rate. So there's no net movement of water either inside the cell or outside the cell. And again, that's because the solute concentration is the same on either side. That's what iso means. Isotonic refers to a solution that is inside the cell just like on the outside of the cell. However, if you have a hypotonic solution, in this case pure water, well pure water there are no solutes in that. So now we have an area where there's very low solute in the water, none, and so water is going to want to flow into the cells that C do have solutes, represented here by the uh, little green spheres. So the net movement of water is going from an area of low solute concentration, pure water, to higher solute concentration. Well, what does this mean for the cell? As you can see, the cell is going to continually accumulate water until it ruptures. Now the opposite, if we have a hypertonic solution, this is where we have a lot of solutes, a high solute concentration in the beaker. Now we have a higher solute concentration on the outside of the cells than inside the cells. So the water that's in the side of the cells is looking out and saying, wow, there are a lot of solutes out there, let's go out there. So going from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So the net movement of water is out of the cell into the water in the beaker. The result of this, physiologically, is going to be these uh, cells are going to shrink and dehydrate. So this is where you can start to see some of the challenges that organisms in fresh water versus salt water are going to have to deal with. Their cells are either going to be uh, potentially exploding because they're absorbing too much water, or they're going to be constantly in danger of drying out and dehydrating. So the challenges that animals face with maintaining their water balance and solute concentrations in their body at the appropriate state is called osmoregulation or osmotic regulation.
Many marine invertebrates simply live in an area that has a relatively stable salt concentration and they just stay at equilibrium with this. These types of animals are called osmotic conformers. They're simply conforming to living in an area that has an appropriate salt concentration so there's no net movement of water in or outside of their bodies. Now this typically makes them uh, restricted in where they can live. They have to live in more stable environments. And we call these types of environments that are very predictable and don't change very much, stenohaline. Steno means narrow. Haline refers to salt. So these are areas where, where there's a very narrow range of salt concentrations and it doesn't change much. And so an animal that would fit this kind of definition of an osmotic conformer would be a spider crab. And you can see in this figure here, the spider crab, the red line indicates where it can live. So it shows the salt concentrations of the seawater where it can live and where it is at each of those points. If you look over on the y-axis, you see that it has the same salt concentration in its body fluids. So it's simply conforming to the area that it's living in. But there's a very narrow range of saltwater concentrations they can live in. So if it gets above this level here, well, that's too salty for them. And if it gets below this level here, then that's lethal because then there's not enough salt in the water. Now, another way of dealing with is to be an osmotic regulator. This allows organisms that can regulate their osmotic concentrations more actively, they can live in fluctuating environments. These are called urihaline environments. So a ure refers to, in this case, broad. So broad salt concentration and more variable. And a species that fits this category is the shore crab. Shore crab, as the name implies, live in bays where there's rivers emptying into the bays. And depending on the flow of the river, there can be more fresh water coming in, which lowers the salt concentration. And that's represented here by the blue line. When you do see the salt concentrations decreasing to uh, as up to even as low as 200, you don't see the same kind of reaction in the salt concentration of the body fluids of the crab. They still maintain that at a higher body concentration. So they're not conforming at least this level to the salt concentrations in the habitat that they're living in. Now at higher concentrations, they do basically exist as conformers, as you can see here. But once it gets below normal seawater concentrations, the kind of average shown here, then they really turn on their osmotic regulatory capabilities. And even when the salt water is getting uh, less and less concentrated, they still maintain a relatively high salt concentration in their body. So how do animals deal with either extremely uh, low salt concentrations or extremely high salt concentrations? How do they osmotically uh, regulate in these situations? Well, in fresh water, the challenge is you have to keep the salt concentrations in the body higher than in the surrounding water. Because if you're in fresh water, there's low salt concentrations and you need a certain amount of solutes, uh, salts and sugars in your bloodstream and in your body fluids. But as a result, you're going to have a constant potential flow of water from the environment coming into your body. Because remember, low solute concentrations in the freshwater environment, high relative salt concentrations inside the body. And so there's always this challenge of water trying to go into the body and puff the fish up. So their challenge is to keep too much water from coming into the body tissues. Now, how do they do that? Well, first of all, is make just a nice protective shield on the outside of your body. So they have nice waterproof outer coverings, like scales, tightly packed scales, that are covered in mucus. This is just one way to actively prevent to the, the water from coming in. Remember, the way we defined osmosis, we were talking about movement across a semi-permeable membrane. Well, the tight scales and the mucus basically make it less semi-permeable, make it more impermeable. But some water is going to get in, so they have physiological ways to pump water out of the body. So in the case of a fish, they use their kidneys to do that. 
invertebrates that we're going to study that are living in fresh water use their nephridia to do this and some of the protozoans that we talk about use their uh, contractile vacuoles to pump water outside of their body and this is something you'll see in lab soon. Fish and other freshwater organisms are also going to need to concentrate the salts in the body and they do that by using salt absorbing cells in their gills, uh, concentrating uh, salts in the excretory structures while they're getting rid of waste they're concentrating things that they need into their blood supply using the nephridia and the kidneys and so forth. What about saltwater organisms? What are the challenges that they face? Well in this case they have to keep salt concentrations in the body lower than in the surrounding environment. So the surrounding environment has lots of salts relative to the amount of salt in the body. Therefore, the challenge that these organisms face is drying out, dehydrating. So how do they prevent this? Well, really they're doing the same kind of thing, just in the backwards way that we talked about with the freshwater organisms. So they still try to make their exterior part of their body uh, impermeable, so make a nice protective waterproof outer covering using scales and uh, mucus covering. That's just going to prevent water from trying to leave the body. They also have very efficient uh, nephridia and kidneys to produce more concentrated waste. This way they don't waste a lot of water washing uh, the waste out of the body. And they do drink seawater in the process of eating their food, but they have these uh, glands in their body that help them to concentrate this salt and secrete it from the body. So these salt secreting cells are found in the gills, in some cases the nephridia and the kidneys. Well, let's move out of the water and onto the land and talk about the osmotic regulation challenges that terrestrial organisms face. Well, they still have to get rid of their nitrogenous waste, and they want to do so in many cases by using as little water as possible, particularly if they live in very dry environments. So they face the challenge of potential desiccation or drying out. And water can be lost uh, in more ways than just ex excretion. Water is lost during respiration, just breathing. Uh, you lose uh, potential water through evaporation. And then also in the production of, of urine during excretion. What are sources of water? Well, water can be gained by the food that you eat, uh, particularly species that, that eat things like fruit, nectar, drinking bats and birds. There's a lot of water in the food that they eat. And even meat has uh, a, a very large concentration of water in it. And so some of that can just come from the food that you eat. Others will need also a source of water where they can literally just drink the water, drink some fresh water. And finally, those of you who've had cellular biology will remember back to aerobic metabolism. The very last stage of aerobic metabolism in the mitochondria, the hydrogen atoms that have been uh, bouncing around in various chemical reactions, end up joining oxygen at the last stage of aerobic metabolism to produce what is called metabolic water. So just the process of breaking the components of, of food down to release ATP uh, also produces water. And in some organisms, this makes up a very large percentage of their water. They don't actually drink. They just get it from uh, their food directly or indirectly via the metabolism. And that can be shown here with this kangaroo rat uh, comparing the ways that they deal with get, getting water and saving water in a very dry desert environment. See, they don't drink at all. Compared to us, well, about 50%, 48% of our water comes from drinking water. Most of the bulk of that in remaining in humans comes from the foods that we eat. A little bit of that comes in kangaroo rats, but they're generally eating dry seeds. So 90% of the water that kangaroo rats get is from the metabolism of the food that they, they eat. And about, only about 12% of that occurs in humans. Now, what about uh, losing the water? They lose about a quarter of their water through urination, so they produce much more concentrated urine compared to humans. About 60% of our water loss is uh, through urine. Evaporation just through the skin and also through breathing, that's about a third for us, 34%. And that's 70%, that's the bulk of where they lose in kangaroo rats. And they do everything they can to even reduce that. They have uh, these uh, densely uh, packed nasal passages that helps to resorb water as they're breathing. 
they spend their days in these cooler burrows so that they lose less uh, water through evaporation that way and are only active at night when it's not as hot and, and evaporation isn't such an issue. And feces is a, a minor part of water loss in uh, both humans and kangaroo rats. So mammals like the kangaroo rat and humans have to get rid of their nitrogenous waste and nitrogenous waste are the product of breaking down proteins uh, primarily. You have to get rid of this, wash it out of the body and different species use different concentrations of urine and so different amounts of water. So for example the uh, kangaroo rat uses very concentrated urine, not a lot of water. We produce very dilute urine because water is something that's more readily available to humans. Other animals, insects, birds, reptiles, do not produce urine. Their nitrogenous wastes are converted first into ammonia and then into this crystalline form called a uric acid. This is an insoluble compound that they then mix in with the feces and excrete it that way. This requires very little water and makes them much more efficient. So if you think about common animals in the desert, some mammals have been able to pull it off, but they tend to be very restricted in their activity and mainly active at night is, is one of the challenges they face. But if you go to the desert, you see lots of insects, lots of birds, and lots of uh, non-avian reptiles. Well, what are some of the excretory structures that help animals maintain appropriate water balance while at the same time getting rid of nitrogenous waste? Well, some of the simplest animals we'll talk about, things like sponges and some of the cnidarians, like hydra, use contractile vacuoles, these organelles that pump water out of the cell. And this is an example of it seen here in a freshwater protozoan. These contractile vacuoles are kind of like a bucket brigade organelle that as water is constantly flowing into the cell due to osmosis, they're constantly pushing it out with the contractile vacuole. Most invertebrates have a structure called a nephridium, and we can break nephridia into two different classes. The first animals we'll talk about that have nephridia have proto-nephridia, and here's an example of this in a free-living flatworm. And what a proto-nephridium is, it's a highly branched system of uh, tubes and ducts. Fluids from the body are collected in structures called flame cells, and they're called flame cells because they have these flagella that are beating to drive the water from the, the body fluid down into these collecting ducts. And if you look at it under a light microscope, the beating of this flagella kind of looks like a flickering flame. So that's where water is coming into the system, going through these collecting tubes. And as it's going through the collecting tubes, that's where water is put back into the body if it's needed, or salts that are re-needed in the body, and sugars can be reclaimed and put back in the body but waste products are concentrated and then uh, sent to excretory pores, shown here, and ejected from the body with variable amounts of water depending on how much water is needed. So this is going to be seen in some of the earliest animals we talk about that are flatworms and some of the pseudocoelomates. The other type of nephridia is called a metanephridia. It's doing basically the same thing as the protonephridia. Body fluids have to come in some pore and in this case, it's called a nephrostome. Stome means mouth. Nephra refers to some excretory structure. So this is the mouth of the nephridium. And then it goes through a series of, of tubules, like we saw in the proto-nephridia. And this is where selective resorption takes place. So recapturing water, salts, it's amino acids, and then put those back in the body. But concentrating waste products that are then excreted through a pore which is called the nephridia pore, so that uh, the waste products leave the body with a variable concentration of water depending on, again, what, whatever the needs uh, of the animal are. Common animals that have a metanephridium that we're covered this semester are annelids and mollusks. When we get into crustaceans, we'll see that they have a structure concentrated on their head end called either an antennal gland, sometimes it's called a green gland, and sometimes there are a few other names but they all basically do the same thing. They're located in the head. They collect material from the body through what's called the end sac. Then again, it goes through tubule for selective resorption of, of materials that needs to be put back in the body. Concentration of nitrogenous waste that are then put into a bladder 
for storage until they're released into the outside environment via a duct. Insects and some spiders have a system called the Malpighian tubule system. This is a series of, of very thin closed tubes that are connecting directly to the intestines. And again, these tubules are collecting fluid from uh, the blood cavity and nitrogenous waste are then concentrated into these uric acid crystals and dumped into the rectum where water that is needed to retain in the body is, is retained and then solutes like salts and sugars that are needed to be retained within the body are resorbed. And this is a very efficient system. It takes very little water for these organisms. And so this is again one of the reasons why insects and spiders are so amazingly common in the deserts because they have this very efficient excretory system of getting rid of nitrogenous waste without using too much water. In vertebrates, the excretory structure is a kidney, a series of kidneys, two kidneys, and the anatomical details, kind of how concentrated they are uh, and how big they are, varies from each vertebrate group, and it's best studied in mammals, and so we're going to use the human as an example of that. So this is the kidney, uh, where it's located in the body. You cut it up and it looks like this, and you can see it has a very rich blood supply, but the functional unit, uh, indicated here by this little rectangle, uh, is blown up here to show us the really uh, key functional unit called the nephron. So fluid from the circulatory system is uh, entering these capillaries of the glomerulus, this ball-like cluster of capillaries shown here, and that forces body fluids into the Bowman's capsule, this encompassing uh, purple little balloon. These fluids, once they're collected, then travel through this highly coiled series of tubules surrounded by blood supply for selective resorption. So again, uh, resorbing water that's needed in the body and solutes that are needed uh, in the body go back into these capillaries. But nitrogenous wastes are then concentrated and dumped into a collecting duct and then eventually drain into the bladder via a structure called the ureter. Well, let's move on to temperature regulation. Temperature regulation is important in animals when they can do it. They can't always do it, we'll see, and that may limit their physiological capabilities. And the reason for that is physiology is affected via biochemical sensitivity to temperature. At the chemical level, enzymes work best at certain temperatures. Just chemical reactions work best at relatively high temperatures. If you've taken chemistry, you know that you heat up chemical reactions using a Bunsen burner so that they'll happen more quickly. Neurons also have nerve impulses moving more quickly at higher temperatures. Muscular activity is also more efficient at higher temperatures and this is why you warm up before you do any sport. You're warming up your muscles uh, making sure that they're going to be more efficient. Well, You can generally break animals up into two groups. Animals whose temperature is dependent on the external environmental temperature are called ectotherms. These animals are unable to regulate their temperature physiologically, so generally we say they are poikilothermic. A poikilotherm means their temperature fluctuates with the environment, and oftentimes this is referred to as cold-blooded. And this is a bit of a misnomer because obviously if it fluctuates with the environment and these animals are in a very hot environment, well, their blood is going to be relatively hot. But they're cold-blooded when it is a cold environment. And most animals will fit this category. So frogs and jumping spiders, as seen here, are not going to be very active uh, in the winter in really cold environments. But there are some exceptions to this idea of poikilothermy. And we'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about behavioral homeothermy in some ectotherms. Endotherms, by contrast, are animals whose temperature is independent of the external environment, at least within some bounds. And that's because they're able to regulate their temperature physiologically. So generally, they are homeothermic, meaning their temperature stays at a pretty steady state and does not fluctuate with the environment. So they're able to maintain a warmed, blooded temperature uh, independent of the outside environment. These are the animals that you see active throughout the year. 
So you can go outside in a, on the coldest day of winter, and you may not see any snakes, any lizards, any insects, but you're going to see birds, you're going to see mammals. There are a few larger reptiles that have at least some limited physiological abilities for endothermy, uh, potentially the dinosaurs. There's evidence that the dinosaurs did. Uh, some fishes like tunas, and even some insects may be partially endothermic. Well, as I mentioned, ectotherms are generally poikilothermic, that meaning their temperature is, is varying throughout the day. But they may have limited ability to maintain homeothermy despite being ectothermic. So ectotherm usually is uh, related with poikilothermy, but ectothermy is just talking about the physiological capabilities to maintain temperature, and poikilothermic just means your temperature varies. Now it's an important distinction because despite being ectothermic, not having physiological capabilities of maintaining a body temperature, a lizard, as shown here, could maintain its body temperature at a fairly steady state and therefore be homeothermic by simply moving around in the environment to areas that have a microhabitat that is the right temperature. So yeah, their body temperature is reliant on the environmental temperature, but behaviorally, they can move from habitat to habitat to maintain homeothermy. So we call this behavioral homeothermy. So at night, it gets very cold in the desert, so a lizard will bury itself and that will provide some insulation so it doesn't lose too much heat during the day. But then when the morning comes, they'll uh, come out of their hiding, sun themselves in a nice sunny area in the early morning hours to raise their body heat. But in the midday, it could get too hot. And so they may hide in the shade under a rock and, and pick the rock that's just the right temperature so that they're maintaining a nice steady state. And then in the late afternoon, they uh, quickly do another bask to absorb some heat before the sun goes down completely and it gets cold again at night and they then bury themselves. So they can maintain a fairly narrow range of temperatures and be partially homeothermic by practicing behaviorally homeothermy. Now sometimes animals just can't deal with this. Uh, ectotherms just can't maintain homeothermy because the microhabitats just aren't variable enough to allow them to move from area to area to uh, maintain a, a fairly stable temperature. So what they do instead is they can do what's called temperature compensation. They can adjust how their metabolism works uh, and use different mechanisms of metabolism in different ways as the temperature changes. So for example, they may have certain enzymes that work well at lower temperatures and other enzymes that work well in higher temperatures. And they just use the appropriate one in the appropriate mm -hmm. circumstance. And they can maintain activity with some temperature changes in the environment and in their bodies uh, by having this temperature compensation. Well, how do endotherms deal with changes in temperature? They, they have the physiological capability of generating heat and they do that because they have very high metabolism. Now this comes at a cost though. If anybody's ever owned a pet snake, you know that you don't have to feed that snake very much. It has a very low metabolic rate, but dogs, cats, any mammal, any bird that is an endotherm has to eat a lot and has to eat very regularly because they have very high metabolism. And there are times when you could get too hot as an endotherm and you still want to maintain a fairly stable body temperature. So some of the things that you can do is reduce activity, reduce the time when you're active, so become nocturnal like the kangaroo rat we discussed earlier, and become fossorial, living underground like the kangaroo rat did. Mammals, uh, at least some mammals, have the ability to increase evaporative cooling by sweating. And as the wind causes evaporation, that draws heat out of the body. Now, not all mammals and birds don't sweat. So what they do instead to have evaporative cooling is they pant. All it really requires is to have uh, some ability to take heat from your body to the surface that is going to be wet and then have water evaporate that uh, heat out of you. And so birds do it 
uh, by painting. Dogs do it by painting. So you have a very uh, well vascularized lining of the mouth. The tongue itself is, is well vascularized. And that panting is drawing heat out of the, the body. Uh, and as that water in the mouth evaporates, it's drawing that heat away. And how effective evaporative cooling is depends on the environment. Evaporative cooling is very efficient in desert environments where there's very low humidity. Evaporative cooling is not very efficient here in humid areas like East Texas. Oftentimes you're just soaking wet because of sweat, but it's really not doing much for you. Uh, it's not really driving that heat away because it's not evaporating because there's too much humidity in the air. In a dry desert environment, relatively low humidity, evaporation is much more efficient and uh, efficiently driving that heat away from your body. If you have never been to the desert, never been to places like West Texas and you get a chance to go, uh, one thing you got to be aware of is you are sweating much more than you think you are. It's just evaporating so quickly you don't realize you're losing a lot of water and you have to drink a lot more water than you may be used to. Uh, so if you're hiking around in a desert sometime and uh, suddenly you start getting a headache, you need to start drinking the water fast because that's one of the earliest signs that you're getting dehydrated. Another thing that you can do if you're getting too hot as an endotherm, find shade. So we talked about just reducing activity, uh, but also get uh, in vegetation, get in a burrow, uh, again, fossorial habitat. These things are going to help. And in very extreme environments, some mammals will undergo what is called estivation, where they decrease their metabolism and become dormant when they just get too hot or food or water are, are just very scarce. They, instead of maintaining homeothermy, they basically shut down their metabolism and give up. And effectively, this is what we would consider facultative poikilothermic, um, becoming behaviorally poikilothermic. Well, what about getting too cold? Well, some of the, you can do the same things. You know, behaviorally, you can find shelter. Mammals and birds can increase their degree, the effectiveness of their insulation by elevating the feathers or the hair, their fur, because insulation is nothing more than a dead layer of air between the body surface and the outside environment. So by puffing up, you're increasing that dead layer and, of, of air and increasing the insulating capacity of the feathers or fur. Shivering is also a way to drive up your metabolic rate to increase body uh, heat. And animals with long appendages have sometimes what is called a countercurrent heat exchange system. And as shown here with a, a paw of this wolf, you can see the red artery starts off at 37 degrees in the core part of the body and as it goes down to the tip of the extremity, the tip of the foot here, it's losing temperature. Now, it could lose that temperature just to the outside environment, but what happens in a countercurrent exchange system is this artery is lying right next to a vein that is driving blood back up to the core part of the body. And see, what happens is this temperature, this hot blood from the artery, is always just slightly hotter than the cooler vein. And so that heat, instead of being transferred to the outside environment and just being wasted, is being transferred to the neighboring vein. So as the artery is going down, it's getting cooler and cooler, but that's because it's transferring that heat to the vein as it goes up, is getting warmer and warmer. And so this countercurrent heat exchange system is a way that endotherms can recover heat uh, and not lose too much heat in the outside environment. Now some of these same animals have ways to bypass the countercurrent heat exchange system when they get too hot because this is not something you would want if you're living in a very hot environment. This is an adaptation to uh, not losing too much heat in a cold environment. Well, we talked about estivation uh, as a way that you can go uh, facultatively poikilothermic when it just gets way too hot or resources become too low. There are other ways that you can become at least temporarily, uh, by choice, poikilothermic if it gets too cold. Torpor is one of these ways. This is adaptive hypothermia 
which means low body temperature, in which organisms will let their metabolism and their body temperature drop on a daily basis, so typically at night. So that's shown here with this hummingbird. You can see in the dark shaded areas this is night, and it shows the oxygen consumption of the bird at this time period. The reason they're measuring oxygen consumption is uh, in aerobic metabolism, the way that metabolically food is turned into ATP or energy for the cell, one of the most important elements in that process is oxygen. So if you're measuring how much oxygen is being used by the animal, you're measuring its rate of metabolism. So low oxygen consumption means very low metabolism. High oxygen consumption means very high metabolism. And you can see many hummingbirds at night in cold areas, they let their body temperature drop. Now, this prevents overnight starvation, but it also means that they're unable to respond quickly to stimuli. So if you ever find a hummingbird that's in torpor, you can go up to it, you can poke it, you can prod it. It doesn't have the capacity to be active like it normally is, as you can see here during the day. So it is adaptive. It prevents them from starving overnight, but it does come at a potential cost. If they're discovered by a predator, they can't uh, respond to that at night. Hibernation is very similar to torpor. It's where you're letting your metabolism and your body temperature uh, drop very low. But instead of just doing this on a 24-hour basis, just, just at night and then cycling back up during the day, this is where you're letting your metabolism and body temperature drop for days or even months. And like torpor, the animal is unable to respond quickly to stimuli. So in this figure here from your book, you can see a groundhog that was discovered when a road crew was uh, cutting an area for a new road and they cut through this one hill and lo and behold they ran into the burrow associated with this groundhog and even with massive dirt moving equipment this groundhog was unable to respond to the stimulus. Now some people confuse hibernation with extended sleep. Um, this is where metabolism is lowered somewhat, not nearly as extremely as during hibernation, because the body temperature uh, still stays relatively high. It may also drop a little bit. Extended sleep can occur for months or, or uh, days, uh, like hibernation. Uh, but this is a, a way that these organisms can not lose too much energy during this period of extended sleep, but they still maintain the ability to respond to stimuli. Uh, and this is actually what most bears do. And this was actually discovered by a researcher who crawled into a cave where they thought a bear was hibernating and they put a temperature probe uh, in its anus and uh, yeah, the bear was able to uh, respond to that. So that's something to be aware of if you get a career as a, a mammalogist and you want to study bears. So in review, we talked, uh, this lecture is all about homeostasis and the challenges animals face in maintaining a steady physiological state. We first talked about osmotic regulation and to understand osmotic regulation, you have to understand osmosis or the movement of water across a cell membrane from a low to high solute concentration area. And there are different challenges for freshwater species, saltwater species, and terrestrial species, and we talked about uh, some of the physiological and anatomical ways that the, these organisms deal with these challenges. We reviewed excretory structures uh, that we're going to be covering in different lineages throughout the semester. These are structures that are dealing with osmoregulation, maintaining water balance, but also concentrating nitrogenous waste for excretion and getting it out of the body, because nitrogenous wastes are very toxic. So some of the simplest animals and protozoans use contractile vacuoles. Then we'll talk about animals that have nephridia, either protonephridia or metanephridia. Crustaceans have antennal glands. Insects and some spiders have malpighian tubules. And then vertebrates have kidneys. And lastly, we talked about temperature regulation. In general, warmer temperatures are associated with greater physiological efficiency, so when possible, animals want to maintain relatively high temperatures when they're active.
Ectotherms generally, however, are poikilothermic. They just have to let their body temperatures change with the environment if they're living in highly variable environments. However, if the environment that they're living in has microhabitats that are of different temperatures, they can remain relatively homeothermic, not physiologically, but behaviorally. Endotherms, however, are generally homeothermic because they have a much higher metabolic rate and so physiologically they can generate heat in their body. But under certain circumstances, they also will need to lower their metabolism in extreme circumstances. So when it gets really hot and food resources are limited, some animals will go into estivation. When it gets really cold and there's the chance that you're not going to find enough food, you don't want to starve, uh, you need to go into another form of very low metabolic rate by going into either daily torpor or more extended long-term hibernation. And we also discussed uh, how endotherms and ectotherms react to different challenges associated with hot and cold environments.